Jesus, we, uh, we come here because we need You. We come here not because we have it all together, but because we don't. And we're in desperate need of someone to clean us up and give us the strength uh, to do better. Um, and we, we can't do that on our own. We, we have nothing to bring to this. Um, so we're glad that we found you, or really you found us, <laughs> because that's changed everything. And for the first time, we really can have forgiveness. For the first time, we really can be free. For the first time, the guilt really can be gone. And for the first time, there's really hope as we think about the future and our lives. So, um, Lord, we don't want to, uh, we don't want the service to be a religious pep talk. We want, we want to, we want to have you speak truth and reality into our lives. And then out of that comes the joy. Out of that comes the enthusiasm. Out of that comes um, the hope. So, Lord, uh, we've spent a week and a lot of people have lied to us. We've spent a week and uh, a lot of relationships. We don't know who really loves us and who doesn't. So we, we come here because we have to get rooted in truth and reality and something solid, something sure, and we need to experience a real relationship with you, someone who truly does love us. And so we're confused about all this stuff, so please help straighten us out and uh, speak to us through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Um, you, you do realize that the uh, majority, you do realize that the majority, a large majority of people living in Ashland will not be in church this morning. Now there's a lot of you, you look around, you go, there's a lot of people here. Yeah, yeah, but do you realize that the majority of people in Ashland, they won't be in church this morning? You ever wonder why that is? You ever wonder what keeps them away? You ever wonder why they wouldn't think of getting up on a Sunday morning and, and coming in here? Um, one of the reasons if you talk to them, one of the reasons is they will say, if they're honest, you know, why should I come to church? I already feel bad about myself. Right? I remember the conversation that one guy had with a prostitute. Uh, he wrote in a book, and he invited her to church, and she said, why should I come to church? I already feel bad about myself. Why come to church and feel more guilt? I mean, who needs to come to church and hear a preacher tell, tell you one more thing you're doing wrong, right? That's what a lot of people, that's how a lot of people view church. And so really, why would you want to get up? Who's signing up for that on a Sunday morning, right? We learned last week, though, that the most important message a church can preach is described as the good news, it's described as the good news. It's called the gospel. The gospel is, is good, good news. What is it? Here it is. It's that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And he was buried and he was raised on the third day. So the good news that a church needs to be front and center with and make sure it gets com uh, communicated as of first importance, the Apostle Paul said, is that you can actually be forgiven. So instead of, you know, well, why should I come to church and feel bad? Well, yeah, I agree with you, man. I mean, I wouldn't want to come to church and feel, just keep feeling guilty either. Why not come to church and get forgiven? Why not come to church and find out how you can be forgiven and actually have a relationship with Jesus, with God that comes alive, and then the power to, to live differently. So what, what the good news is that you can come, you can bring all your guilt, you can bring all your shame, you can bring all your failures, you can bring all your brokenness, you can bring all your sin, and you can actually dump it. You can dump it at the cross and say, 
Jesus, I am tired of all this. I am sick of this. I'm walking away from this. Please forgive me. I'm yours. Now, I don't know about you, but that, I think that's really, really good news. It's good news for me. It's good news that I've never gotten over this, this, the gospel. Wow, you mean I can really take all this, this, this dark stuff, this sin, and, and dump it and actually be forgiven and restored in my relationship with God and be, that's right, that's right. Wow. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing you realize, and we saw this last week, the Apostle Paul brings it out in the book of Galatians, that the thing is not all churches preach that good news. See? And this is what happens in churches. You know, they, well, I'm not going to church. Well, maybe, maybe you really haven't heard the good news. Paul says there are other gospels. Like any church is going to say they preach the gospel, but Paul says you got to you got to you got to be you got to beware. There are other gospels that are out there that just really aren't good news. Like, you know, there's churches that would preach the gospel that just says, you know, you need to believe in Jesus and work harder at being good and obeying the Ten Commandments, and then you know God's loving God, and maybe you know you the good outweigh the bad, so we're all working hard. You know, that's not good news. If, if I'm coming to church. And somebody says to me, you can work harder at being a good person. You know what? That's not good news to me because I tried and I can't do it. That's not good news. Uh, sometimes uh, you can go to church and they'll say the good news is Jesus came and you need Jesus because Jesus is going to make you rich and Jesus is going to make you healthy and Jesus is going to give you a better marriage. Well, you know what? That's not good news if I'm divorced and single. Oh, Jesus will give me a better marriage? Well, that's not going to do me a whole lot of good. All right? Uh, Jesus, uh, if the only message is the good news is Jesus is going to make you wealthy and, and healthy or whatever, you, you go, well, that's nice, and I, who wouldn't mind a little more money? Who wouldn't mind feeling better? But, but can you deal with my soul? Can you deal with the weight and the guilt and the sin and the darkness in my soul? that um, can, you, can you help me with that? You know, that's, that's the good news. That's the gospel, right? Sometimes you can go to churches and they'll say, you know what, here's what we'll do. We'll just dodge the whole question of sin. We'll just dodge the whole issue of sin. Forget about sin. There's no judgment here. We just accept everybody. We don't talk about any of that stuff called sin. And let's all just do a group hug. And you go, well, you know, it's nice to be loved by people. It's nice to be, but you know, how about like God, like, you know, what do I do? I think I'm going to die and someday I'm going to face God. And here's the good news, folks. Jesus Christ came into the world to save, rescue sinners. Jesus said, I came for sick sinners. Now, if you're a sick sinner, then that's really good news, right? If you're just a religious person, then, you know, I, I'm frankly, I'm not going to get out of bed for that. Jesus said, I came for sick sinners, not for people who think they're basically good. So, so if you're new with us here, or you've been coming to Grace, look around, and what you see in the room is not people who have it all together. Here at Grace, these are not people who have it all together by a long shot. But what you do see is people that came to the place, many people here come to the place where they go, you know what, they got sick. They got sick of their sin. They got sick of trying to justify themselves. They got sick of trying to make themselves not feel guilty when they knew they were. And they finally just said, okay, I'm done with this. And they came and found Jesus and forgiveness. And, oh, and, and it's changed everything, you know right? We're not what we ought to be, but we're better than we used to be, and it's all Jesus. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a wonderful thing. So that was last week. The, this message, this gospel, this is good news, has to be very clearly communicated, and it is of priority importance, okay? And so, you know, um, you, know you heard about upward basketball and, you know, how many children how many people uh, indicated hey i got that I, I want that you know last sunday and 
there were some of you who indicated by raising your hand that, you know what, this is making clear to me this Sunday morning. It's wonderful. That starting point thing that you heard the video on, a great class to get into and say, all right, now I want to walk through this. I want to make sure I got this right and, and uh, sign up for it next week at 9 a.m. All right? All right, today, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to continue this series on the gospel, and I want to talk about the cost of the gospel, the cost of the gospel, okay? First point is this, that the gospel is about a gift. Very important, the gospel is about a gift, all right? Uh, many of you like the outlines in, in the program there. It's, it's good, it, it's fun, I'm glad you enjoy filling them out, all right? I, I do them for you, you know, because some of you, uh, when we don't do it or I don't give you the blank right, you go, hey, I got I to gotta have the blank. And so we're, we're, it's good. All right, the gospel is about a gift. Uh, here, here's why. Watch these verses on the screen. We'll just quote some verses and see if you, you, the point comes out uh, pretty, pretty clear. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it's by grace that you've been saved uh, you've been rescued from sin and judgment and hell. That's what Jesus came to do, die for your sins. That's all grace. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. This isn't you signing up for religion, being a religious person. This isn't you joining a church. This isn't you getting baptized. No, this is, this is not your own doing. It's a gift of God. Salvation is a gift from God. It's not a result of works so that no one can boast. No one can say, well, I think I'm a pretty good person. Well, no, that's not, no. This is a gift. You, you're, you're given the righteousness of Christ. You're given forgiveness and salvation. It's a gift. Uh, Romans 6.23, uh, real clear, the wages of sin is death. That's what I have coming to me uh, since the day I was, hit the planet. Uh, but the free gift of God is eternal life eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is about a gift. Now, it's interesting, Jesus met up with a lady. He was thirsty, went and he was in the wrong neighborhood. Many Jews thought he was in the wrong neighborhood because a bunch of Samaritans lived there. These were like half-breed people. They were discriminated against. Jesus goes to this well because he's thirsty. Here comes a Samaritan woman. Now, that was like, you know, in the... In the in the time, that was the people that were really low on the pole. And she comes to the well, and Jesus said, uh, Could you, I, I would like a drink. Would you give me a drink? And she's shocked that he would ask. And then Jesus, Jesus, uh, Jesus knows her. He knows her. And she's a very thirsty woman. She's thirsty because she's been married five times. I mean, she's trying. And none of them worked out. And now she's living with a guy. I mean, she's kind of given up on a lot of things. And it's like, you know, she's a pretty desperate situation. Listen carefully to what Jesus says to her in John chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you right now, give me a drink of water, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. See, Jesus, what he offered that lady, this, this dear lady had spent herself relationally and had not found satisfaction. She tried everything. She kept trying. But what she was really thirsty for in her soul was only something God could give her. Jesus says, I want to give you living water for your soul. And she was very interested if you follow the conversation. But it's a gift. This eternal life is a gift. Relational wholeness is a gift. It, it, 2 Corinthians 9.15, um, Paul's writing about an offering, a monetary gift that they were giving and the people were excited about it and it really meant some real needs and it was a wonderful thing. And Paul's just saying, you guys have no idea in Corinth, when I deliver this gift, these people are going to be so excited, they're going to be so thankful to God for the money that you sent and how you met their very real needs. And he wraps up the conversation and puts it all in perspective by saying, but thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift 
and that was Jesus Christ. The gospel, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, is a gift. It is portrayed that way all through uh, the scripture. All right? Now, here's the problem for some of us. Here's the problem for some of us. We have trouble receiving. <laughs> we, when it comes to gifts, let's go around. Salvation is a gift. Okay, but maybe you're someone who has trouble receiving. Um, you can't give him anything. Oh, really? you, have tr- you just have trouble. You know, I, I walk through the mall, a nice lady with a nice smile comes out of this kiosk and asks me if I would like a free sample. And I say no. You know, what's wrong with me? I tell my wife, don't even look at her. Don't even look at that guy. <laughs> I, what, what, what's my problem? You know, somebody calls me on the phone. The caller on the phone says, is this Daniel Allen? I said, yeah. You have won a free trip to Disney World. And I hung up on him. <laughs> What's my problem? You know what the deal is? We're suspicious of free gifts, aren't we? We're very suspicious of free. But listen, what if salvation, forgiveness of sin, and eternal life, what if it really is a free gift? Sometimes, sometimes we have trouble receiving because um, it's humbling, right? You ever recognize that about yourself? Boy, I sure have. It's a humbling thing. Our pride and our self-sufficiency refuses to take a hand out, or we go, no, 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 no. Because we, our pride and self-sufficiency refuses to take a hand. I'm not taking a hand out. Hey, come on. Sometimes you know, our pride and self-sufficiency makes us resistant to graciously accept a gift because somehow in accepting a gift, truly embracing a gift from somebody else, you're admitting that you're needy. And we don't like to be needy people. No, 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 I don't need it. No, oh, no, 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 no. Well, let me give you some. No, 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 no. Hey, let me buy. No, 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 no. What's, what's going on? We, 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 have, we have trouble receiving, and so when it comes to salvation, see, there's something in of us that wells up and goes, well, man, I, I, wanna, I need to add something to this. You know, I, I need to be a part of this. Hey, what can I do to make? No, 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 you can't do anything. Salvation is a free gift that you can, can only be humbly received. See, forgiveness of sins cannot be earned Think about this. Forgiveness of sin. Jesus is going to forgive you. He's going to pay for your sin. It, it cannot be earned. You can't go to God and say, you know what, uh, okay, you, you forgive me. I'll make it up to you. No, no, you don't, you don't make anything up to him. If you add anything, if you bring anything to the table, all right, God, I'll tell you what, we'll pick out a deal. I'll, I'll do a whole lot better next time, and, and we'll just make up. I know I've done this, but you cut me a little slack, and, and I'm going to, no, 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 that's not salvation. You're just signing up. You're just bringing, you're still bringing something to the table. No, you bring nothing to the table. If you contribute in any way, if you pay in any way, if you say, well, I'll do it, then it's no longer salvation. It's no longer a gift. It's no longer grace. See? Jerry Bridges, I I love what he says in a tremendous book called Transforming Grace. Get it, read it. It's a great book. Grace is not a matter of, by the way, it's on the front. Have you seen the front of the church? Have you seen the word? You've seen the 18 foot letters up there? I wish they were 54 foot. Grace is not a matter of God's making up the difference in your life. Yeah, I know I've done some things, but you know, I'll try, and, and God's going, well, I'll help you. No, <laughs> no, no, it's not a matter of God's making up the difference, but of God's providing all the cost of salvation through his son. Jesus Christ. See, grace ceases to be grace if you contribute anything. If 
you stick your religious fingers into your salvation at all, it can no longer save you. It's no longer the gospel. When we go to God and say, can I do something? He says, no. Isn't there any way I can pay you back for this? No. Can I at least leave the tip? No. Salvation, the gospel, is about a gift. Second, you have to understand this. Second, the gift was expensive. The gift was very, very expensive. Um, Romans chapter 3 uh, the verse right before this says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Wow, that's the offense. That's the price. Uh, so, and we, but, but it says, but we are justified by His grace as a gift. So it's free. It's grace. We get justified. We, we get declared not guilty and righteous before God. That happens as a gift. But it costs, Right? This gift is through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood. So what those two verses say is that grace is free to us, but it cost Jesus His life. It's free to us. It's amazing. Uh, but it costs Jesus' life. Uh, last week I mentioned grace. G-R-A-C-E could stand for God's riches at Christ's expense. The gift was very expensive. Our justification before God as the judge is a legal reality. Do you know that? In courtroom terms, the Bible describes some things. I had a had a unique privilege this past week. The, the family of, of Judge uh, Paul Corpany asked me to speak at his celebration of life service. So, so I had a chance in town to, to speak to uh, a whole room full of judges and lawyers from Ashland. And I took them to a courtroom scene. I said, I'm so excited to talk about this because you guys are, are giving your life to, to administer justice. And so here's a courtroom scene. Where are we going to get, where is justice served when we are the criminal? Our justification before the judge, the legal reality, it happens that we're declared righteous only because, listen, Jesus served our death sentence for us. Jesus is the one that took the wrath of God for us. Jesus is the one who died for us so that divine justice could be satisfied. God is a righteous, holy, just judge of all the earth, and justice will be served with every single individual who's ever walked the earth. That's frightening to think about unless you hear the good news that, guess what? Jesus will pay the price to, and justice is served and the gavel comes down and you walk out a free woman. You walk out a free man and it's a legal reality because Jesus has served your death sentence. This is what is meant by the phrase that God put forward Jesus as a propitiation by His blood. As a propitiation, as, a, as an appeasement, as a sacrifice. Because God's going to pour His wrath out and either you will take it in an eternity in hell or you can take Jesus who took it for you. This is a stunning thing. This is good news, folks. This is really, really good news. God put forward Jesus as a propitiation by His blood. And so what's very clear in the Scripture is this. The gift was very expensive, and here it is. It was blood is the payment for sin. Blood is that payment, that expensive payment for sin. Now, go a little, you know, run, run with me here through the Bible, all right? Uh, Hebrews 9.27 makes an interesting statement. Without the shedding of blood... 
So with, and maybe I'm hoping that a lot of this whole blood thing is going to make a lot more sense to you today. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. You go, wow. Well, here's the reason. Somebody has to pay. If I murder somebody, somebody has to pay. If I steal, somebody has to pay. Justice has to be served. And, and so somebody has to pay. And the price for sin is extremely expensive. It's not like you stole a candy bar. I mean, it is, no, this is, like, this is like offensive against a holy God. So the price is expensive. Now, I want to follow the, the trail of blood in the Bible. Okay? Can you follow the trail of blood in the Bible? Throughout the Scriptures, one commentator said the Old Testament is a bloody pageantry. And it is. Man, you start reading the, the Bible and you're getting into Exodus and Leviticus and one animal after another is getting killed and they're taking the blood and they're spattering all over. If you would have shown up in the Old Testament sacrificial system, if you walked into the temple, if you walked into the tent, the tabernacle that, that they set up at Mount Sinai when they left Mount Sinai going to the Promised Land, if you walked in there, there's blood everywhere. I mean, there's blood everywhere. And you're going, what's up with this? Right? Well, here's what's up with it. Keep verse in Leviticus. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. See, Blood is the payment for sin. Now, it's not that the blood itself is magical, okay? The blood is a visual manifestation of a life being poured out in sacrifice. The life is in the blood. And so all those animals, all those bulls and goats and lambs, it was symbolic Blood has to be spilled. It represents a life that is given because that's the payment required for sin. All right? The life is in the blood. Now, watch, tra- trail with me through these passages. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. In these sacrifices, so you go back to Old Testament days and all these sacrifices, all these animals getting killed and blood, and you walk in and you know, you sin, so you come to God and you put your hand on the animal and slit its throat. I mean, there was a, a connection. This animal shedding its blood for me to make atonement for my soul. In these sacrifices, there are a reminder of sins every year. All, all the time, day in and day out, more blood. Yep, because I keep sinning, right? But here's the deal. It's impossible for the blood of these animals, bulls and goats, to take away sin. It was a symbolic covering, right? It's impossible. The blood of a lamb doesn't take away sin before a holy God, right? Every high priest stands daily at the service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. One more lamb, all right, one more goat, dead. It can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, this is significant. You remember how John the Baptist introduced Jesus. John the Baptist says, you guys better get ready. You guys better repent and turn from your sin because he's coming. He's coming. Who's coming? John 1.29. This is so... you when, you when you walk all the way through the Old Testament, year after year after year after year, and all of a sudden you hear this. Jesus came toward him and He said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Whoa! The blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can take away and deal with sin. Hebrews 9, watch this, makes this comparison between the the Old Testament animals and Jesus. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. In other words, there's a thing that Moses did, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, that was all symbolic 
of the real deal, okay? He, Jesus, entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of His own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. That's why Ephesians 1, 7 says, in Him, in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. The blood of Christ atones for sin, pays the ransom price. You know, a lot of times what religion does is it, 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 it says, you know, we're going to give you a chance to redeem yourself. We're familiar with that phrase, right? Well, they need to redeem themselves. You, you'll see a football, football game, guy drops a pass. The next pl- play, the quarterback throws the ball back to him. They're giving him a chance to redeem himself. Well, there's no possibility of us redeeming ourselves in a holy God. Someone else has to redeem us, and that was Jesus, and the cost was his blood. That was his life. That was the cost of covering our debt. It's the only thing that satisfies divine justice. It's the only acceptable payment to God for sin. We sang it this morning, church. What can wash away my sin? What is it? That's right. Now you know why? Yeah. And, and this, is, this is Christ's greatest work. This is God's greatest work. This is the most astounding, astounding thing that he's done. Uh, an old Puritan, Thomas Merton, um, Thomas Watson, I'm sorry. Um, he said this, great was the work of creation. Don't you think Genesis is impressive? God spoke the heavens and the earth. That was an amazing thing. But greater the work of redemption. It cost more to redeem us than it did to make us. In the one there was but the speaking of a word. See, God just spoke the word and people were created and the worlds were created. But in the other, there was the shedding of His blood. Our redemption was the greatest work that God has ever done. So, the Gospel is all about a gift. But, my goodness, the gift was expensive. So, the final thing is, what is our response? So, what should our response be to all this? What's our response? You know, what's the appropriate response to a gift? You know, it's, it's, I, I like watching the kids at Halloween. Uh, we have a thing out here and where we do the trunk or treat and everybody lines up. Kids from all over the community come and you guys come and go by. And, and I, I, I just get the biggest kick out. I love giving kids candy. It's great. And um, I, it's always fun to watch the parents, too. Uh, you know, the conscientious parents and kids get candy, and guess what they say? You know, they say all the time. Now, tell, what do you say? You know, kid gets candy. Hey, trick or treat. Hey, how you doing, buddy? Here you go. What do you say? What do you say? Mom's on there. What do you say? Dad's go. What do you say? What do you say? Kid goes, I don't know. What, what do you mean? What do you say? Trunk or treat? Give me something else. What do, what do you mean? What do I say? And so, what the parents doing is they're training them about the appropriate response to the gift. And so they say. Thank you, right? Christmas time, you get a gift. Go give Grandma a hug. Ugh, what for? You know, what, what do you mean? What are you trying to do? Well, you're trying to teach them an appropriate response to, to, the, to the gift, right? All right, so what's salvation, the gospel, all of this is a gift. Incredibly expensive. Staggeringly expensive. You can, we can't get our heads around how expensive this gift was. So, what's the appropriate response? Um, 1 Peter chapter 3. Turn there in your Bibles. 1 Peter chapter 3. As we round it up here. 1 Peter, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Now, it's on page 1014. If you want to grab a Bible in the rack in front of you, turn to page 1014, and that's where you'll find this. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'll start reading in verse 13. Okay, 1 Peter 1, uh, I'll start reading in verse 
13. Peter, by the way, knew a little bit about the need for forgiveness. Think Peter messed up a few th- times. Jesus, oh, I don't know Jesus. I, uh, Peter, was, Peter was a guy, what a mess. Peter's like, you know, is Peter going to go? And you know, Peter understood what it meant to be forgiven. And he understood a lot about grace. And it radically transformed him. He's writing, Peter's writing, therefore, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ comes back, where is your hope? If your hope is, I'm really building a pretty decent resume as a decent person. And when Jesus comes back, I'll go, look what I've been doing. Is that what your hope is? That's, that will drive you into perfectionism. That will drive you into the ground. That will drive you into being the most self-righteous Pharisee you, you, you obnoxiously ever want to meet. But if your mind is focused on the grace that will be brought to you, Jesus is coming back. And He paid for all my sins. And he's got me covered, and he's going to take me home. Whoa! You set your hope, your focus on the grace that's revealed, right? So, in the meantime, verse 14, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. This was before your BC days, as we say around here sometimes, before Christ. You know, how well were we living before Christ? Man, that was stupid. I couldn't believe how stupid I was. That's what Peter's saying. Yeah, Peter's going, I was pretty stupid too. So why, why, why are you going back to being stupid? You know, why, why are you doing that? That's kind of my loose paraphrase. As he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you should be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear. Take this seriously throughout your time of exile. This isn't our home. We're aliens on this planet. Now watch this. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Do you hear what Peter's calling us to? Peter's going, now, this is a staggering thing, this gift and the expense of it. Now, here's an appropriate response to those of you who are believers, who in repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ have received the gift of salvation. You have been ransomed by the blood of Christ. What's our response to all this? Well, the first thing is you have to understand what this says about your value. Your value. Question, where does your worth come from? Are you worth anything? Are you of any significance? Are you an important person? Where does your worth and significance and value come from? Well, for the typical person, their value and their worth is in maybe their looks. You know, so they concentrate on it. I got, I got to look good. Well, why? What does it matter whether you look good or old or ugly or wrinkly? Or what does it matter? Oh, no, no. Because they feel like their, their worth and their values in their, their looks. Maybe for many it's in their career. Do you have worth and value? Yeah, what? Well, this is what I do. This is what my job is, my career. Maybe it's your abilities. You know, athletes, professional athletes. You know, where, where is your worth? Well, it's in my performance, my ability to throw a basketball through a hoop. Maybe your worth and value is in your family, or maybe it's your net worth. Are you important? Well, yeah, you know how much I'm worth? Listen, all of those things are very, very shaky markets. Very shaky markets. And what Peter is reminding us is this. If you have been ransomed, think of, listen to this language, knowing, verse 18, that you were ransomed a huge price was paid for you you were ransomed not with silver and gold 
not with Microsoft stocks. You were, really, you were purchased, you, you were purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? You know, I look at my wife, who's a believer and been ransomed, and I say, honey, you are one high-priced woman. She is. And so are you. You know what? If someone held you for ransom, someone held you for ransom and they want $5 million. So your family's going, man, we've got to get them out of there. And so your family gathers together $5 million in Monopoly money and goes and gives it to the, the guy. I mean, how's that going to come across? The guy's going, is this a joke? Well, silver and gold is Monopoly money when it comes to paying our ransom to God to buy us out of slavery to sin. Peter wants that to sink in. Wants to sink in. That needs to sink in. This is an appropriate response to the expensive nature of the gift of your forgiveness is to go, oh my word, I, I had no idea that this God values me that much. I love the song and we sing it here. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in winning and losing, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. And then the refrain of the song is beautiful. Two wonders here that I confess. My worth and my unworthiness. My value is fixed. My ransom's been paid at the cross. The other appropriate response Peter has is, is your conduct. Your conduct. He talks about how we live in light of this, you know, your conduct as, as obedient children, verse 14. But don't be conformed to the passions of your, your BC days. That's a crazy way to live. Verse 17, conduct yourselves with, with, with fear throughout your time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from these futile ways inherited from your forefathers. This is uh, on my trip. Uh, to the Philippines on our way back just a few weeks ago. We, uh, we made our way up to Manila and then from Manila flew eventually back here. So we had a few hours between flights um, and so Kevin Smith, who was leading us, said, I got to take you to this war memorial. This is in Manila, carved out in the middle of this huge city. Manila is an amazing city. Carved out in the middle is this massive cemetery. These are Americans and Filipinos. It's, a, it's, it's an unbelievable place. And there are those who died in World War II in the operations in the Pacific. All that stuff going on in the Pacific, it's, 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 it's not real clear to us. But some of you, if you've been there, you know, this is real clear to me, man. I was on a boat there, you know, whatever, you know. But, but to, to, to many in the generations coming, it's like it's, it's a mystery. Well, they got all the battles there. They show everything that happened. And, and you walk through. There's 17,097 headstones. Then there's a ring of walls. There's all these walls with names on it, and they're the ones who are missing in action. 36,286 names. And I want to tell you, you know, I walked through this place and it's manicured. It was beautiful. You walk through this place and all these crosses and all of these names. I'm telling you, you can't help but be moved by the fact that my freedom came at a cost. 
the freedom I get up every morning and enjoy and walk in here and enjoy came at a cost. A staggering cost. A cost I have a hard time wrapping my head around, right? Now, what should my response be? As I walk through that cemetery, what should my response be to this? Well, you know what it is? And the graves there would scream it. Live free. Live free. Live free. Live well. Enjoy your freedom. Why in the world would I vote for a communist dictator? I mean, it's like, I have the freedom to do it. I could do it as an American. I could vote for... Why in the world would I do that? It would make no sense at all, right? So what Peter is reminding us here is the cost of our freedom. As you walk around the the cross... And you think about the ransom that was paid to free us from our slavery to sin. What is our response to this? You know what Peter's saying our response to this is? Live free. Live free. Live free from sin. Enjoy your freedom. Why would you choose to go back into the bondage of sin? Why would you do that? It it was ignorant. Sin, sin makes a slave of you. Sin is addictive. Sin, sin just destroys you. He goes, you have been freed. Why would you go back there? Why would you choose to go back there? Live as a free person. Pursue holiness. Find satisfaction in your life as a child of God. Now there's a caution I have to give you at this point. Your obedience to God, your conduct as a believer is not to pay back grace. We can get into this so easily. Well, I better be right because I better pay back, you know, God's, I better pay. No, 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 no. Any good thing you do as a believer in Jesus Christ does not pay back grace. In fact, it draws on more grace. You can't do anything good at all unless God's grace floods through you. So this is, this is all grace. The grace of God brings salvation and has appeared to us, and it's grace that teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. That's what Titus says. I, the, 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 only, the best illustration I, can, I know of uh, to illustrate this is one I've used before, and it's, just, it's probably one of my, my favorite uh, stories of all time. It's about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln went to a slave market. He came upon a slave market and he looks and on the block was a young and beautiful African-American woman and she was being auctioned. So Lincoln walked up and he began to bid for her and he won. Sold. He could see the anger in the young woman's eyes and he could only imagine what she was thinking. Here we go, another white man is going to use and abuse me. As Lincoln walked off with his new purchase, he turned to her and said, you're free. And she goes, yeah, what do you mean? He said, you're free. I paid your price. You're free. She goes, eh, you know, are you a little suspicious? You know, we're suspicious of free, aren't we? Does that mean, does that mean I can say anything I want to say? And Lincoln says, yep. It means you can say anything you want to say. Well, does that mean I could? Does that mean I can be anything I want to be? And Lincoln said, I'm telling you, you're free. You can be anything you want to be. And then, and then she's like, she doesn't know what to do with it. And then she says, I, do you mean like I can go anywhere I want to go? And Lincoln says, yes, you are free. You can go anywhere you want to go. And the woman, with tears 
running down her face, said, well then, I'm going with you. I'm going with you. See, when you understand the cost, when that registers with you, and it breaks you, and you bring your sin, and you turn, and you're, it's free. You don't bring anything. You don't earn it. You don't work it off. You can't bring anything to it. And God says, I've ransomed you with my blood. And you're free. Go. Then you know what goes off in us? Well, in Jesus, I want to go with you. Let's pray. Have you ever heard the gospel? Have you ever heard the good news? Maybe this morning it's registering with you for the first time. It's a gift. You turn from sin. You roll all your stuff and by faith accept the gift. It will transform you. It will transform you. There will be birth in you. Sometimes people are hesitant to receive salvation and say, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ because they think, I can't do it. You're right, you can't. But in salvation, God will make you a new creation. He will put inside of you the love and the desire to follow Him and the power and the strength to obey Him. And you will want to. <laughs> Father, um, stun us again with the cost of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.